Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Good friend of mine is an attorney named Todd Levitt. And Todd does a lot of criminal defense work up in the Mount Pleasant area of the lower peninsula of Michigan, right about there, home of Central Michigan University. And he called me over the weekend and said, Steve, I just had a, a big win in court. And the interesting thing is the judge wrote a lengthy opinion explaining the rationale behind what happened. And it's got a really good statement of the facts and an explanation of the law. So I said, let me check that out. So he sent me a copy, and I have in my hand the opinion written by the judge in the state of Michigan, Isabella County Trial Court, people of the state of Michigan versus uh, a defendant uh, named Frost. And uh, I will now talk to you about the opinion and order on defendant's motion to suppress. So the man was charged with something that had to do with evidence acquired by the police. And the question is, in their acquisition of said evidence, did they do it properly or not? And if not, then one of the remedies is to say the evidence becomes inadmissible. But what's interesting, like Todd pointed out, is that the judge explains all of this quite clearly. So it is an illuminating thing to read. So this is the opinion and order. Defendant is charged one count of possession of meth arising out of a vehicle search subsequent to a traffic stop. So traffic stop, vehicle search, the location of the uh, contraband, and then charges followed. The facts are not in dispute. So a lot of times when I talk about the facts of a case, a lot of people ask me and say, wait a second, how do you know that's what happened? You weren't there. You say that all the time. Yeah, I was not there. But the judge writes that the facts are not in dispute, meaning that at the hearing, the judge asked Todd, the defense attorney, are those your version of the facts? Yes, that's our position, Your Honor. She then asked the prosecutor, do you dispute those facts? No, Your Honor, we all agree on the facts. So that happens sometimes. Quite often, the parties will agree on the facts. The question simply then is, how does the law work with those facts? The facts are not in dispute. On the date in question, officer and a field training officer uh, conducted a traffic stop on a vehicle driven by defendant. Two police officers and a defendant driving. Defendant had changed lanes and turned into a gas station without using a turn signal. The officers stopped the vehicle at a pump at the gas station, which was located at the corner of Isabella Road and Pickard Street in Isabella County. After the vehicle came to a stop, one of the officers approached the driver's side of the vehicle. The other one approached the passenger side. The officers did not observe any contraband in plain sight, did not smell anything either. Then, one of the officers requested the defendant provide his driver's license along with proof of the vehicle's registration and insurance. He was able to provide the proof, but was unable to locate the vehicle's registration. He didn't have his driver's license on his person, although he indicated that he did actually have a valid license. That's one thing that people often talk about, is that if you're licensed to do something, that thing you carry... Uh, is not actually what gives you the power to do it because you can still drive even if your license is at home. But guess what? They have a ticket they can give you for not carrying your license, but it's not the same as being an unlicensed driver. So he uh, gave the officer enough information so that the officer could check to make sure he had a valid license, which he did. He then asked for identification of the people in the car, and it turns out that one of them was a minor. Okay. After acquiring all the information from the occupants of the vehicle, the officers returned to their vehicle. The occupants remained inside the defendant's vehicle. They ran the uh, information through the system and got photographs of the occupants from dispatch. They got all this information about these people. They figured out who they were and so on. As a result, the officers discovered that the defendant had given valid verbal identification information. So when asked who he was, he told them the truth. Also, he had a valid driver's license and no outstanding warrants. So they also discovered the vehicle had a valid registration. Six minutes after stopping the vehicle, the officers had completed their investigation into the traffic offense that was the reason for the stop, and that was the failure to use a turn signal. Uh, there was no ticket ever issued for the tra traffic infraction. So six minutes later, they know what's going on. It's a fairly short stop at that point. And the officers have completed their investigation. So the officer then goes back to the vehicle and requested the parties to step out. 
According to him, they had suspicions about the situation. It seemed suspicious. The officer believed that there could have been criminality occurring. Criminality occurring. He testified that he based his suspicion on the fact that defendant argued with him about the validity of the stop. Additionally, the defendant was on probation and didn't have his driver's license on him. And there was a juvenile in the car. There was a, there was a minor in the car. So the officer testified that he intended to continue the conversation about whether the stop was valid and obtain the contact information for the man's probation officer when he asked the defendant to get out of the vehicle. So he says, I pulled the car over. The guy was arguing with me about the traffic stop, didn't have his license on him. He's on probation, and there's an underage person in the car. I think there might be criminal activity going on. What's the criminal activity that you think is going on? So you'll notice when they say things like criminal activity, you could narrow it a bit, couldn't you? Well, not, not on these facts, you couldn't. No. And by the way, how many people do you think disagree with the validity of a traffic stop when pulled over? <laughs> if that's the basis of further investigation, ain't nothing ever going to get done other than long conversations at the roadside. Outside of the vehicle, twice the officer asked the defendant whether there was anything illegal in the vehicle, and both times he said no, there's nothing in there. The officer then asked the defendant the name of his probation officer. Defendant knew the probation officer's first name, but not her last name. He indicated that he had his probation officer's telephone number. However, the officers did not request that defendant provide to them the probation officer's telephone. He goes, I got her number. You want to call her? No, that's okay. Officers did not attempt to contact the probation officer at that time. Both officers asked for consent to search the vehicle, and defendant did not consent. Defendant did not give consent to search the vehicle. They asked him twice, can we search the vehicle? No. Can we search the vehicle? No. While defendant and the officers conversed about the reason for the stop, defendant pulled a vape pen from his pocket and began to inhale from it. Now, I would have advised you if I was there to not do that in front of the officer. Just can't that wait. But for whatever reason, he decided to vape in front of the officer. Now, defendant is 19 years old and could not lawfully possess a vape pen. So the officer confiscated the vape pen and indicated that the officers were going to search the vehicle based on defendant's possession of a vape pen. So you're not old enough to have that, son. We're going to search your car now. Eight minutes, by the way, had now passed. So the first six minutes doing the investigation, the next two minutes at the side of the car outside, and defendant had been outside of his vehicle for approximately two minutes. The math checks. I, I, <laughs> at the preliminary examination, one of the officers testified that before defendant possessed the vape pen, he did not believe that the officers had probable cause to search the vehicle. Each officer testified at the examination that he believed that defendant's possession of the vape pen was a misdemeanor. But now they realize that, in fact, it is a civil infraction. It is not a misdemeanor to possess a vape pen at the age of 19 in Michigan. After the officers informed the defendant they were going to search the vehicle, the defendant indicated that there was, in fact, marijuana in the vehicle. Officers considered this an additional concern about the prospect of criminality. The defendant told the officer that he did not have a medical marijuana card. Approximately 10 minutes into the traffic stop, the officers proceeded to search the vehicle. And one of the officers testified he found a glass pipe in the driver's side door, which based on his training and experience is commonly used to ingest drugs. In a basket of clothing in the back seat next to the juvenile is another glass pipe. According to an officer, he also found numerous bags containing marijuana. And in the center console, he found a bag containing the stuff that's in question here. So a test on the bag tested positive. During the search... Defendant was located outside of and in front of the patrol vehicle. An officer testified that defendant was not free to leave the scene. During the search, after contacting dispatch, the officers did learn the identity of defendant's probation officer. The officers discussed pursuing a probation violation. There is no evidence the officers ever contacted the probation officer at that time. After the search, according to the officer, he discussed the results of the search with defendant. He did not read defendant's Miranda rights, and according to the officer, 
defendant advised him that his DNA could probably be found on the pipe. However, he said that his DNA would not be found on the baggie if they were to test it. After the search, the officers decided to call the juvenile's mother. Officers also considered calling defendant's probation officer. Ultimately, they arrested defendant, took him to Isabella County Jail. It is unclear whether the officers attempted to contact defendant's probation officer immediately prior to his arrest. A preliminary examination was conducted. Defendant moved to exclude the evidence, uh, obtained as a result of the stop. Uh, the um, officers testified at the examination. Additionally, the parties stipulated to the admission of the video. So there's a video of the traffic stop, which clearly showed the totality of the incident. So the court's basically saying, it's nice these people testified, but I can watch the video like anybody else and tell you what happened, other than what the officers were thinking. Because it came out in court that somebody asked the officer, what was your probable cause for searching that vehicle without a warrant? And they said, well, guy didn't have his license on him. He's on probation. And he's arguing with us about the traffic stop. Okay, question is, is that probable cause? So in relevant uh, part, the Michigan court rules at MCR 6.110 talk about how evidence will be excluded under certain circumstances. In this case, defendant does not dispute that the officers conducted a valid traffic stop based on reasonable suspicion that defendant had committed the civil infraction. That what we're talking about is a failure to use a turn signal. Rather, defendant argues that the traffic stop became unlawful when he was asked to step out of the vehicle and detained. Defendant argues that his detention at the scene, which went beyond the scope of a traffic stop, did not reveal new information supporting a reasonable suspicion of criminality. As such, the search of his vehicle was unconstitutional and the evidence must be suppressed. That's the argument my friend Todd Levitt is making on behalf of his client who's in the court. And this is, of course, the judge recounting all of this. Both the United States Constitution and the Michigan Constitution guarantee the right of the people to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. A seizure occurs when, in view of all the circumstances, a reasonable person would conclude that he or she was not free to leave. Notice they're saying a seizure, not an arrest, a seizure. The lawfulness of a search or seizure depends on its reasonableness. So the judge goes through a whole litany of these cases that all say the same thing about this. The issue in this case, therefore, is whether the officers had a reasonable suspicion that defendant was engaged in criminal activity such that they could lawfully prolong the traffic stop as indicated in the cases above, whether continued detention is permissible after investigation of a traffic infraction has been completed, often involves whether new facts are revealed during the traffic stop that warrant extending the detention. In this case, the officer testified that he believed that there could have been some criminality occurring. He based the suspicion on the fact that defendant argued with him about the validity of the stop. Additionally, defendant was on probation. The passenger was also on probation, apparently. Defendant did not have a driver's license on his person, and there was a juvenile in the car. Uh, the officer testified that he ordered defendant to leave the vehicle because he intended to continue the conversation about whether the stop was valid and also obtain the contact information for the probation officer. Is there some reason you can't speak to the man through the window that's rolled down? Got to step out and talk to him? Oh, I'm just curious. In this case, the record supports a finding that defendant argued with the officers about the validity of the stop. However, defendant did not become confrontational or aggressive. Rather, he maintained control and obeyed the officers' commands. Under similar circumstances, our Court of Appeals here in Michigan has noted that it would be circular and inherently problematic to conclude that expressing disagreement with the lawfulness of an officer's actions may be used to create a reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. They cannot say, well, you know, you're arguing with us. You must be a criminal. <laughs> we are free to argue with the cops. So as such, defendant's objection to the validity of the stop, without more, cannot support a finding of reasonable suspicion. Similarly, the issue of defendant's lack of a driver's license on his person was at most weak, weak evidence of additional criminality. By the time the officers decided to extend the stop by asking the defendant to get out of the vehicle, 
They're aware the defendant had a valid driver's license. The officers had enough information to ticket the man for the offense if they had seen fit to do so. Likewise, the fact that one of the occupants of the vehicle is a minor without more provides little support for reasonable suspicion of criminality. However, after stopping the defendant's vehicle, the occupants of the vehicle informed the officers of the fact that they were on probation. The officers soon learned the defendant was on probation for a weapons offense, and the passenger was on probation for a narcotics offense. Generally, an officer's knowledge that a defendant has a criminal history is not enough to create reasonable suspicion, even when combined with other weaker indicators of criminality. However, in this case, the combination of the occupant's criminal histories, along with their probationary status, provided justification to extend the stop for further intervention. So the judge is saying, you know, with all of this stuff adding up, it would make sense that they could extend the stop a little bit more. But they can extend the stop. The question is for how long and then what happens next. Indeed, after the defendant got out of the vehicle, the officers asked him for the name and telephone number of his probation officer. He could not provide the probation agent's last name. However, he told the officers that he had her phone number. For a reason that is not clear to this court, the officers did not take the information. The officers made no attempt to contact the officer. Instead, the officers continued to ask the defendant for consent to search the vehicle and were denied. After the officers and defendant concluded their discussion of the validity of the stop, and after the officers were able to obtain the contact information of the probation officer, the reasons given by the officer during his testimony at the examination for extending the stop had concluded there was no additional articulable justification to continue the stop. Regardless, the officers not only failed to contact the probation officer, but they also declined to allow defendant to leave. At that point, the officers still had an unparticularized hunch that criminality was afoot. They thought, they, they suspected, they had a hunch, and the courts have repeatedly ruled that's not enough. Number one, you can't measure it. Number two, they they might be caused by just you being imaginative. So the fact that you have a hunch that something's going on does not rise to the level like, oh, we get to search this car now. I have a hunch. However, they had not discovered any additional information that would have led to a reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. They also had failed to further investigate defendant's probationary status or conditions by contacting his probation officer. Rather, the officers extended the stop and continued to detain defendant at the scene until they had what they believed was probable cause to search the vehicle. If defendant had not displayed the vape pen, it is unclear under the circumstances uh, whether the traffic stop would have concluded. As such, this court must find that defendant's continued detention after the conclusion of the mission of the traffic stop and the opportunity to investigate the probationary terms of status was unlawful. The extended stop was unlawful. The people also argue the defendant's statements regarding the existence of marijuana in the vehicle and his possession of a vape pen provided additional reasonable suspicion to extend the stop and, in fact, justify the search of the vehicle. However, importantly, this new information occurred well into defendant's detention. Generally, Information obtained after the officers decided to prolong the stop cannot retroactively establish a reasonable suspicion. Because obviously, if they, if they could find stuff later to justify their earlier actions, <laughs> wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> but also, it would mean that these laws will become meaningless. In this case, defendant's criminal history and probationary status justified the officer's extension of the traffic stop long enough to investigate those things. However, once the officers had declined to contact the probation officer, the justification for the extended stop had concluded. As such, the continued detention was unlawful. Having found that defendants' Fourth Amendment rights were violated, this court must determine whether this result requires the exclusion of the evidence seized during the resulting search of the vehicle. And then the court goes into a long discussion about that, But generally speaking, the exclusionary rule forbids the use of evidence acquired from governmental misconduct, such as evidence from an illegal police search. So if it was gotten through governmental misconduct, it then 
is forbidden to be used in court. So there's a bunch of case law on that. There are exceptions to that, but they don't apply here. Defendant also argues the officers lack probable cause to search the vehicle and challenges the constitutionality of admission of the uh, statements he made before he was given Miranda. Having already ruled that the evidence must be suppressed, this court need not address those arguments. This court, having excluded the evidence seized as a result of defendant's unlawful detention, find that the people have not met its burden of demonstrating evidence sufficient from which this court may find that there was probable cause that defendant committed the offense of which he is charged. As such, this court declines to bind the defendant over on the charge in the felony complaint. Therefore, the motion to suppress is granted, and this case is dismissed. And it's signed by the judge at the bottom, dated February 3rd, 2023. And so you have a very simple set of facts, but this is such a common occurrence, common occurrence, where uh, police are driving along, they see someone commit a traffic infraction. They pull the car over, and as they're interacting with the person in the car, they have suspicions. They have a hunch. They've got concerns. And so they question a little bit more. And there are some things going on here. Guy didn't have a license on him. Okay? So obviously to check that, they're going to take down some information, go back and run it to see if it makes sense. But it turns out the guy had a license, just not on his person. And he's on probation. And he said he's on probation. So the first part of the stop lasted six minutes. They go back to the car. They ask the guy to get out of the car. He gets out of the car. And while they're talking to him, he shows that he has a vape pen. And that's, that's a problem. And like I said, <laughs> probably could have done without that. But for whatever reason, that was the thing where they said, okay, guy's on probation. He's got a vape pen, which he's not supposed to have. And he did the thing with the uh, no turn signal. And by the way, one of the most ironic things about this entire story, never wrote him a ticket for the turn signal. <laughs> right about now, there's two cops in Isabella County who are thinking, we should have written him for that turn signal. But they didn't. But they didn't. So after he shows that he's got a vape pen, they go, okay, all of this stuff added up together now gives us the basis to search that vehicle without a warrant. And uh, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And so the question always is, how long should the stop be? And a lot of people, I've, I've read in comments to videos and I've, I've heard discussions on this, and a lot of people will point to different rulings by the courts that have said, generally speaking, that once the purpose of the stop has been concluded, the police really need to let the person go. And we've seen situations before, where somebody gets written a ticket, and the police officer walks back up the car, has a ticket in hand, and continues questioning the driver. And then after a little while, he goes, you know something? I'm going to go call a dog in, go get a canine unit out here, or something. And they're not supposed to just prolong these traffic stops in fishing expeditions. And I've seen some courts that have said things like, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 20, whatever it is. But the point is that there really is not a bright line set in the law. And what the judge points out here is that who would have guessed that the first part of this transaction, you pull somebody over, make contact, ask a bunch of questions, find out who they are, go back to your car, get all this information fed into the system, get a response to the system, walk back up the car in six minutes. I would have guessed that would take 10, 15, you know, but six minutes, okay? Ask the guy to get out of the car. He gets out of the car. He's out of the car for two minutes, so grand total of eight minutes. But they apparently have already decided not to write him a ticket. So why are they delaying this? Why are they getting him out of the car? And at one point, they detain him. There's no question he's been detained. And the court very clearly talks about the fact that the officer had a suspicion and a hunch and so on. And one of the things that you hear people talk about is a reasonable, articulable suspicion. And generally speaking, if a police officer pulls you over, there should be a reason that you were pulled over. And they should be able to explain it articulable. And it should be reasonable, reasonable, articulable suspicion. Here's the only issue that I see people misunderstand quite a lot. I've seen someone get pulled over and with body camera footage and so on, they go, what's your reasonable, articulable suspicion for pulling me over? There's no losses they got to tell you. They may have to explain it in court, like here, but the law does not say they've got to tell you it's the side of the road. 
and I've already done videos on this, they don't have to tell you why you're being arrested. They can arrest you without telling you the reason. You don't think they can pull you over without telling you the reason? So there will come a time, if you put up a fight, where they will have to explain the basis of pulling you over and searching your car and whatever they do. And if they can't explain it to a judge, they'll lose. Now, it's a pain, obviously, to spend the time at the side of the road, uh, get arrested, get charged with a crime, have to hire an attorney up there in Mount Pleasant. But this is the end result right here. And so the case was dismissed, thrown out. So I got to thank Todd for sending it to me. Todd's up there in Mount Pleasant. In fact, I'll put a link to Todd's website in the description below the video. I've known Todd for about 30 years now. Uh, he used to have an office right near mine in Farmington Hills, and he and I go mountain biking together. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't tell anybody this. We played hooky from work quite a bit in the summertime. And it was not uncommon. About 3 o'clock in the afternoon, my cell phone would ring, and I looked down, and it's Todd. <laughs> I know what he's going to ask me. It's not raining outside. And he goes, Steve, Pontiac Lake, or Steve, Island Lake. Uh, you know. And I'm like, dude, I'm there. And it got to the point where occasionally I'd just leave my bike in my truck. <laughs> Go to court for the day. I'm done, whatever. He calls me at 3 o'clock. Boom, it's a race out to Island Lake. So... I've known Todd for a long time, and Todd does criminal work. So if you're in the Mount Pleasant area and need a good attorney, or if you have a student uh, family member up there at Central Michigan and need a good attorney, have him called Todd. But again, that's the people of the state of Michigan versus Frost. Todd L. Levitt, attorney for defendant. And that's the case where the charges were dismissed due to the unlawful search results. Questions or comments, put them below those. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. If we live in fear, we only live half a life.